we're so glad that you all could be here today, and it's just wonderful to see an overflow crowd. So we appreciate you bearing with us just a moment to set up another table and chairs. So it's just wonderful to see a room full of good-looking folks this morning. So we want to say welcome to everyone this morning. And on behalf of the Relay Committee, we want to say we're glad you came to our third annual Survivors Brunch. And we want to thank uh, Dr. Jones' office and Homeland Community Bank for helping sponsor this today. We're gonna begin this morning with our uh, invocation. And Mr. McLaren will be back in just a second. He's gone to get us some table paper. So we, he's gonna offer our blessing for our brunch this morning. And also Mr. Charlie Myers will come up and do the pledge. At that time, we will go through, we'll form two lines over here to my right and go through and get our food. We'll come back and sit down and then our guest speaker will speak to us this morning. So again, welcome. We wanna be sure that you've taken care of the things as you come in. So I think everybody has registered, but if you did not register, please register at the table. Miss Shirley Luna is sitting at the table in the back. Also, she's waving her hand at you. Also be sure and get your survivor T-shirt that's on the table back there. Ms. Deanna Barrett's been working with the handprints this morning, so we want to thank her. Be sure and put your handprint on there with the number of years that you're a survivor. And if you see on the back wall, we're hanging last year's banner that we did at the brunch. So, and we hope to hang that the night of relay for you to see as well. Also, the next table is the luminarias. And Ms. Brenda Moore has a bowl back there. So if you want to purchase a luminaria in memory or in honor of anyone, please do so. There's a bowl that you can drop your check and the information filled out to do that. Those who are set around the field, if you remember, on the night of relay. And then the last table is the look good, feel better table. So I'm sure many of you have taken advantage of that uh, through the years. So we're going to ask Mr. McLaren, did he get back in? Mr. McLaren, if he'll come up and offer the blessing for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that you bless these people that are so involved in this very, very special organization. This is a day of celebration of life, of survival, and focusing on your word and on your son. These people have gone through many hard times, and perhaps some will still have hard times ahead of them. But we know with your guidance and your love and your care that each and every one of us will come through these hard times as it says in the book of James, that we are strengthened through difficulties, but you will lead us through them. We are humbly grateful for your son. We are humbly grateful for all the workers here that put so much time and effort every year to put this together. We ask that you bless them, bless all the survivors and their families, and watch over them and help them through these difficult times. In Jesus' name that we humbly pray, amen. going to go ahead and get started with our speaker now and it's my privilege to introduce this young lady and I've known Miss Pam for several years now we go to church together so she's kind of close to my heart and she was born and raised in McMinnville she's the daughter of the late Arnold and June Brewer she has four brothers here in McMinnville one sister who lives in Jefferson City Tennessee she has been married for 16 years to Mark Shelton of Manchester. They have two children, Cameron, age 11, and Mallory, which we call Mal for short, who's six years old. Uh, Pam works with the health group of McMinnville with Dr. Brian Chesting and Dr. Homer Kirby. She's a medical lab technician for them. 
Pam was diagnosed in 2006 with synovial cell sarcoma of the head and neck. And she's gonna tell us about some of that in her talk, so I don't wanna take away from that. But she's been a survivor since 2007, and she actually got started with Relay through a cousin of hers. And I think she'll share that too, so I don't wanna take away from that. But if you will help me give a warm welcome to Ms. Pam, then we'll have Pam come up to the podium. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Thank you for the invitation to come speak to you today. I am by no means a public speaker, so if I stumble a time or two, you have to forgive me. Uh, I spoke uh, several years ago at the Relay for Life kickoff, and uh, so as Cindy mentioned, I go to church with her, and I guess she got me in the corner and just asked me if I would come speak, and I couldn't say no, so. Here I am, and I appreciate the opportunity. As Cindy said, I was diagnosed back in 2006 with synovial cell sarcoma. And a lot of people are you are probably going, what is that? Because that's what I said, it's very rare. There's only less than 100 cases in the whole United States of this type of cancer. Um, it's, it comes from a joint in the body. All your joints in the body are, have synovial fluid in them. And uh, it's usually found in the knee or an elbow, but I happen to have it in the jaw area, the head and neck. And uh, it's usually found in children, actually. So uh, maybe I'm just still a child at heart and it just chose to pick me as an adult to have this because it's very rare. Uh, my doctor, my oncologist, who has been uh, practicing for over 30 years, uh, told me he had never seen anybody ever have it in the head or neck like I had it. So. It was very rare. Uh, I kind of guess I was like a case study to them, uh, having it in this area, but uh, I was very shocked. Uh, I've been healthy my whole life. I would had two children, never been to the ER, never been anywhere for anything. And uh, actually, I guess I'd been showing some symptoms of some things going on with myself, and I'm in the medical field, and I guess I should have known better, but I just kind of blew them off. Uh, I had numbness in my chin. I couldn't feel my chin for about a year and uh, mentioned it to my husband and maybe my sister-in-law mentioned it too, but never went to the doctor, never told a doctor that I could not even feel my chin right here in this area when I touched it. So uh, then my ear, right, right ear started hurting and uh, I told the doctors that I worked with that I had this ear trouble and they kept on saying, there's nothing wrong with your ear. We don't see anything wrong with your ear, you know? So uh, that started back in August of 2005, and it took from 2005 of August to the next February of uh, 2006 that um, my face started swelling. And uh, not just a little bit, I'm talking by day by day, my cheek just got larger and larger. And uh, so they sent me to an ears, nose, and throat doctor, and he immediately said that uh, I had something that an uh, antibiotic wasn't going to fix. He felt like I had a uh, mass in my neck. And um, so I had scans done, and of course, I had a mass. And uh, a mass doesn't sound bad, but a mass and a tumor are the same things. And when I looked at the report, that's all it talked about was a tumor, 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 you know, and I thought, I thought I had a mass. Well, it's the same thing, actually. Just a mass actually sounds better than a tumor. And uh, so we biopsied it, and guess what? I didn't have cancer. I, it, was, it was negative. My biopsy was negative, and the plan was just to remove this mass from my neck. And uh, so I went in to have surgery, and uh, seven and a half hours later, uh, I come out, and uh, my doctor had told me the worst-case scenario would be is if it was below the jawline that they might have to break my jaw. He didn't think that would come up, but they would have a, uh, a surgeon on call that would do that in that case. So uh, when I woke up in recovery, the nurse looks at me and says, don't try to talk, your mouth is wired shut. Uh, they had to break your jaw to get the tumor out. So not only was I getting this removed, now I've got my mouth wired completely shut and uh, that's gonna be like that way for six weeks. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, you thought I would have got skinny by not eating. If you can imagine drinking through a straw for four weeks, not eating any food for four weeks, but I don't think I lost a pound. He told me most people don't lose weight that way, that uh, I had to drink a lot of shakes, and 
actually, I had to let the, the shakes melt to even get them in. I had two spots right here that I could see, actually stick a straw in and uh, drink those. But uh, he said most of the time it goes by so fast, most people don't lose any weight. So uh, I thought I might get skinny, but I didn't. So anyway. Um, Every week I would go and they would uh, unhook the rubber bands so I could brush my teeth. I actually could only brush the front of my teeth during this time. And so every Friday I got to go and uh, brush my teeth. And uh, so about after three weeks, I was kind of desperate for food. I mean, I was, you know, hungry. You can imagine being at home with your children, your husband, and your church is bringing in lots of goodies, lots of nice things for them. You know, I've just had surgery. And all I get to do is look at them. So uh, I got desperate one night. Somebody had brought a cherry cheesecake, and I like cheesecake. And I told my husband, I said, you put it in a blender, because I'm going to drink it. <laughs> and I tried it. It was not that great. You know, not like it looked when it was sitting there in the bowl. But uh, he added milk to it and got it down as thin as he could. And I, I uh, tried to sip on it. And like I said, it was, it was all right, but nothing great. Um, but about after the third week, my sister-in-law took me back to the doctor, and when he cut those off, she had took some yogurt and some things and just said, let's try to see if you can, you know. And uh, I couldn't. I couldn't even literally open my mouth, really. Um, no matter how, I was, felt hungry, it was just my mouth had been shut together for three weeks already, and it just didn't know how to actually open to try to eat. So uh, that didn't work. So um, after four weeks, they uh, cut me in uh, open and uh, left all the metal in my mouth because they said in case if something happened over the next few weeks, they would want to put me back to sleep to put all the metal. And you can imagine, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody's mouth wire shut, but it's not a pretty sight. It doesn't look good at all, and uh, it was actually scary to my children. I think that was probably the scariest part was that. And, uh, if anybody knows me, they know I like to talk, and uh, I've never met a stranger, but I think that was the best four weeks of my husband's life. That, I, that, I, that uh, He didn't have to listen to me talk. Uh, I had to write a lot of notes and everything. But uh, So uh, I could start trying to eat a little bit after four weeks, and uh, after two weeks, I went back, and they put me back to sleep, and they removed off of the metal brackets because my jaw was back together and everything and so they felt like I was safe to kind of start eating you know some things just to kind of watch it so uh, that was the part of my surgery and actually after four weeks of uh, right when I got my mouth unwired I went back to work because I was ready to go back to work I'm not somebody that likes to lay around and four weeks was enough of laying around for me so I went back to work and uh, uh, that worked out all right and so uh, like I said, I didn't think I had cancer, and uh, I get a call from my doctor's office, and I'm in the medical field, so I know when you get a call, sometimes it's not a good call, and they said they'd like for me to come back the, uh, to see him the next day, and uh, so I had called my family, and I said, I don't think this is a good sign. I think, you know, he had told me when he removed the tumor that it looked odd. He just, you know, they always send him off, but he, you know, he just wanted to let me know that it didn't look very well even though my biopsy had been negative. So, uh, uh, like I said, I worked with a group of doctors. So that night, Dr. Homer Kirby, who, is my, who I work for and is my neighbor, he lives in my neighborhood, he came to my house and said he'd like to talk to me and Mark. And that my surgeon had called him to tell him that, that he got the results and it was cancer, this synovial cell sarcoma. And Dr. Kirby said, I grew up with Pam my whole life. I know her. I, you know, do you care if I go talk to her first? And he said, no, by all means, I wish you would. And so he came to my house and sat down with Mark and myself and said, you know, we've got this back and you have cancer. And so we went from there. And um, actually, I, went to, I worked for Tennessee Oncology for three years at Centennial Hospital in their lab. So I worked with a group of oncologists and had been around a lot of people with cancer. And, you know, um, I said, that's who I want to go to. I want to go back down there because the nurses, I'm sure, are the same, still there. And uh, so that's who I went to. And uh, when I went back, actually, my mouth was still wired shut when I went to meet with uh, my doctor. And uh, they couldn't believe it was me. They said they saw the name on the schedule that day. And they kept on saying, surely that's not Pam that worked here with us. You know, surely that's not her. And, 
He knew that it was because he knew that they had made a special call to talk to him and say, you, you know, this is Pam that was employed by you for several years and she'd like to come see you. And so um, anyway, uh, he wanted to wait till I could uh, get back to eating. He wanted to give me a month or two to get back to eating well and get, you know, uh, get my strength built back up and get healthy before I started chemo. And uh, started chemo and really didn't have much problem with that. I mean, I didn't feel the greatest, but you know, I still worked every day. I'd go to chemo and I'd go back to work the next day and uh, no problems. Um, I had great uh, church support. My husband, like I said, I have two small children. Uh, one that just turned 11 yesterday. Uh, so he would have been eight at the time and my daughter was actually three when I found this out. So uh, I started chemo and he just planned on maybe 12 or, uh, to 14 treatments and started that and done fine. Um, told me that after I took my first treatment, he said within two weeks you'll lose your hair. And uh, I don't know if y'all like me, but I have a lot of hair, thick hair, and I thought, I'm not going to lose my hair. I just really thought that because I have a lot of hair. And uh, I, after the, about the first week, I hadn't lost it. And I kind of thought, well, I think he was wrong. I'm not going to lose my hair. So uh, one morning, I wake up to go to work. And it's just all over the place. And I uh, get in the shower. And I guess, me, like many of you, it just starts falling out everywhere. And so I call work and just said, you know, I can't come to work today. I said, my hair has fell out. and. I'd already ordered a wig, and uh, I'm going to have to go and take care of that today. And so, uh, done that. But, uh, you know, I just really thought he was going to be wrong. I thought, I'm going to, I worked with him. I know this doctor very well. And I thought, I'm going to prove him wrong, that my hair's not going to fall out. But uh, he proved me wrong, because he was right to the day. He said, two weeks it will fall out, and two weeks to the day, that's what happened. And so, uh, uh, my dad. Went to, I would go to work in the mornings and put my wig on so my children had not seen me without my hair. And I guess I was kind of hiding that from them. And so on Saturday morning, you know, I didn't get up as early as I normally would to go to work. And so my daughter came in there and she saw me without any hair. And so you can imagine she's three and she says, Mama, how'd you go like this to your hair? She thought I'd pull my hair out. Have you ever heard that expression? You're gonna make me pull my hair out? Which I guess she thought I literally did because she wanted to know uh, what happened to my hair. And I said, you know, remember mama's taking medicine that the doctor said, well, I would lose my hair and that's what's happened. But it will grow, he says it'll grow back. So uh, she was all right with that later. It was a little, it, you know, she had her days where she wasn't for sure about it and everything. And, uh, my son done really well, but it was her. I guess she was just being her age. And uh, I remember going to the ball field one night to watch my son play ball. And I didn't wear my wig that night because it was so hot. And it was in the summer, and I just wore a hat. And uh, one of his little friends said, Miss Pam, I like your hair. And I said, thank you. And he goes, oh, no, I really like it. And I said, now, you do know I don't have any hair, right? You can tell. He goes, yeah, my mama told me, but I still like it. And I said, well, thank you. I thought that was very nice of him telling me he liked my hair, considering I didn't have any. Um, but anyway, so um, did the chemo. And like I said, I did great. So uh, I'm starting radiation. And uh, this was with the sinker for me. I know most people do very well with radiation, but my radiation was right here in the mouth. and. Uh, so eating was not uh, anything good for me. Uh, that's where I lost the weight. You know, I didn't get skinny when my mouth was wired shut, but I sure got skinny when I got my radiation. I dropped about 40 pounds in four weeks, I guess. Um, I just couldn't eat anything. Just, uh, I was just so sick, I just, I literally couldn't eat anything. And all I was doing was drinking Ensure shakes, basically, to get me some uh, protein so I could, you know, just have some strength. But uh, I, uh, Went to radiation every day for eight weeks, and uh, I had only been doing radiation. I had planned on working during radiation. I already had it planned out. I'll go to radiation every morning. I can be at work by 12, you know. That lasted about three days. In three days, I didn't feel good and just said, I just don't think I'm going to be able to work, and that's just not me. I don't miss work forever. And uh, by two weeks, I was already in the hospital. I went down on a Friday to take treatment, and I was so sick. And my doctor, I took the radiation that day, and she saw me, and she said, I think you need to be put in the hospital. And uh, my daughter was turning four the next day, and I had this big birthday party planned. And 
this big jumping equipment. I, you know, uh, rented the church, my church. I'd saved, just, you know, I wanted to have that party there, and so uh, they put me in the hospital. And uh, Mama's in the hospital for Mallory's fourth birthday, and my husband and all my friends and family just went on with it. You know, they kept on calling me on the phone or sending me pictures, texts, you know, showing me how fun Mallory was having and how it all turned out. Luckily, I'd already had it planned and everything was kind of in place. I just needed everybody to kind of be there to do it for me. And uh, I spent the weekend in the hospital, uh, two days, and uh, uh, Labor Day was that Monday. And uh, so luckily that gave me another day off to, from radiation. I didn't have to go and I started back back on Tuesday and uh, so uh, went on with that and in the meantime I still lacked about two more chemo treatments and I went to chemo and I was sick and and had already been in the hospital and he said you know doctor your doctor your radiation oncologist which he knew well thinks my chemo is what's making you sick he said but I can tell you it's not my chemo that's making you sick it's that radiation he said but you only lack two more I'm not going to make you take them. He said, if it comes back next month, it's not because you missed these two treatments. He said, that's not going to happen. You've took enough. But in order for you to be able to do the radiation, which they desperately thought I needed because uh, uh, this rare cancer where it was especially, they really thought I needed the radiation. So uh, he let me not finish the last two chemo treatments, and I just was in full force with the radiation. So about... Uh, Four weeks into radiation, I was ready to give up. I, told, I talk, met with my doctor. We, uh, I would see her once a week just to see how I was doing, you know, and I, but I would go every day and I just said, I can't do this. I said, I'm just too sick. I was down to 115 pounds and I had no energy and literally just laid on the couch except to go to treatment to come back home. And that is not like me. My uh, biggest adventure of the day would be go to the mailbox because uh, I got lots of cards, and uh, that was the highlight of my day was going to the mailbox to see what cards I got from who and to read them, and that's about all I felt like doing at the time. And um, So she said, you didn't come this far to stop now, did you? And I said, I just can't do it. I, I can't do it. And she said, oh, no, you can do it, you know. And uh, she said, yeah, I promise you, you'll get through this four more weeks. I'll fly by, and, you know, you're thinking, oh, no, I don't think it's going to. And... Uh, so she taught me in the, you know, she said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you an extra day off this weekend. She didn't like to go more than three days without taking it. She said, but I'll give you Monday off. I'll give you Saturday, Sunday, Monday, give you another day of, of resting and getting your energy back. And then she said, you'll come back. And I said, okay, I'll try it. And uh, my sister-in-law was with me and, you know, they were all trying to talk to me and say, oh, you can do it. You can do it. And so anyway, I went back and I did end up fish, finishing them. I think I had 38 treatments. And uh, that, was a, that was the hardest eight weeks of my life, I believe, because that was so hard and I was so sick. And you know, I still have kids at home, so every day my kids were coming in from school and uh, they knew where to find me. I was always upstairs on the couch and uh, it was just hard to not do things. I had my husband, you know, cooks, cook supper and took them to school and just really done a lot. Uh, he probably don't get as much uh, credit as he should for all that he done during that time, but anyway. So I finally finished, you know, couldn't believe it. And uh, actually, my cancer, the way it was, I had to wear this mask. And I don't know if y'all have ever seen Jason, one of those scary Halloween movies, but that's the type I had to, I had to put this mask on. That's how they knew where to radiate me. They don't do it like they did back um, 10 years ago where they marked you with eggs with markers and stuff on the face. They, they mold this mask to your face when you first start. And every day they put this mask on and you lay down and they bolt that mask to the table so I couldn't even move my head or anything for while well, I was taking this radiation. So at the end, you know, they give me this mask and I'm like, I don't want that mask, you know. I threw it away because it was scary and all it did was remind me of that. But anyway, uh, so it was over with. And uh, so now it's time to recover. And uh, I was at home and this, I finished my treatments on a Wednesday and uh, not feeling well. And by Saturday, my girlfriend that works with me, that's Dr. Chastain's nurse, she was calling me and asked me how I was doing. I said, I'm not doing good at all. I said, if I'm not feeling better by Monday, I'm gonna come to the office to be seen. I said, because I'm sick. And she said, well, I'm gonna come out there and check on you. I'm gonna run by, I'll be out there in just a few minutes. I'm gonna come see, you know, come see you. And so she came and she, 
uh, come to check on me, and she said, uh, I got up to go to the restroom, and she said, when I stood up, my pajamas fell off of me, and she said, I looked like a skeleton. She said, I knew you were sick. So she called uh, a nurse practitioner, Miss Greta Mint. Now, I don't know if y'all know any of y'all know Greta, but she was so wonderful to me and took me to a lot of my treatments when I was sick. And she came to my house and uh, she checked my blood pressure and just checked some things about me. And she said, I think you need to go to the hospital. And at that point, I was like, I'm ready to go. I didn't really care. You know, I was just ready to go. That'd be fine with me. As long as they make me feel better, I would go. So this was already about 11 o'clock, I guess, on a Saturday night. And we, um, get my kids somewhere, and me and my husband and Greta, we go to the hospital, and uh, I worked for Dr. Chastain, and he came out there and, to see me, and uh, he asked me what was wrong, and I just said, I'm sick. He, you know, he's like, what's wrong, what's hurting? I'm, I'm sick. I mean, I couldn't tell him what was hurting me. I, my whole body from head to toe hurt, I was just sick. And uh, he said, well, we're gonna get you better. And uh, so I spent a week out here at River Park, and uh, you know, sometimes some people, have negative things to say about River Park, but I'll tell you what, they were so good to me, and I spent a week, and they made me better, and um, they didn't bother me. They came to check on me, gave me my medicines, but they knew I needed some rest, and I just needed some fluids, and that's, that's what they were there for, and it was absolutely wonderful. So um, they did a great job out there, and I even sent them a thank you card after that for being so great to me in the time that I was out there. So I spent a week out there, and. Uh, when I went back, I did feel better, you know, not 100%, but I felt a lot better after that stay. When I went for a follow-up with my radiation oncologist, she said, you know, she said, when I got that call from Dr. Chastain and he, and he told me he'd put you in the hospital, she said, I expected it. She said, I was waiting for the call. She said, I gave you more radiation than more people could ever tolerate. She said, if you'd been an older person, she said, you would have ever stood it. She said, but that's what I had to do to make sure this doesn't come back again. And she said, I knew you could handle it. Even though you didn't think you could, I knew you could. And I knew you would end up in the hospital. I didn't know when, but I knew it would be soon. And so she expected everything that happened to me. So um, like I said, I was very fortunate that I worked with a group of doctors that I know that I can call in a heartbeat. And just by even working at Tennessee Oncology, I knew the nurses, they gave me their home phone numbers. I mean, I had some special care uh, that I knew I could call them any time about any problem I was having. So um, after that, I recovered for the next, this was in the end of October. I recovered November and December at home and um, went back to work in January. January 2nd uh, of 2007, I went back to work and even my radiation oncologist says now, she said, I can't believe you just took two months off after that. She said, I can't believe it. She said, I have people all the time want me to take them off work longer and longer and longer. And she said, I look at you and can't believe that you went back to work. And uh, I probably didn't feel the grace at going back to work, uh, but you know, I'd been home for several months and uh, I just felt like I needed to get out of the house and that would do me some good. So uh, I went back to work and been back ever since and uh, been in remission since 2007. Uh, just recently had scans about three weeks ago and everything's great. And uh, I tell them down at uh, the radiation, where I took radiation at Stonecrest Hospital, that they were great to me, but I never want to come back. And if you told me I had to go back, to, I, don't, I just don't know if I could ever do it again because that was just so hard and scary for me. Um, but anyway, um, I got a lot of cards. I've kept every one of them. I got over 200 cards sent to me, to my house, during my sickness. And uh, I tr I've tried to, got, to get better about sending cards to people. And I think that was the highlight of my day every day, was going to the mailbox and getting cards. So I hope, I want to encourage everybody to send cards. And I've tried to get better. And I know there's been times when I'm not, because sometimes when you're home all day long and you're not talking to anybody and you're not feeling well, a simple open the card and somebody saying they're thinking about you can go a long way because it sure went a long way with me. I had cards from people I didn't even know. Uh, people from other uh, family members that don't even live here that go to other churches that sent them to me. And so uh, I really want to encourage that. And like I said, I've tried to get better for that myself. Um, 
and uh, my church family, if it wouldn't have been for them, uh, I had so much support from them. Uh, a lot of visitors, a lot of them taking my kids to church for me, a lot of them, you know, taking my kids to school, picking them up, helping Mark. Mark still, you know, had to work while I was sick, you know. You have to have that insurance and uh, that income coming in. So, you know, there's a lot of people that took me to chemo and to radiation when there was times that Mark couldn't. And uh, so uh, I want to tell you how I got started in uh, Relay, actually. Um, I had a cousin named, by the name of Ed Bailey. He lost his battle with uh, lung cancer in 2005. And he had been in the military. And he had gotten cancer and he came back here to try to uh, get better and take his treatments and just try to uh, be at home and uh, so he uh, that's how my family got started in relay he started the night the uh, warriors for a cure through central church of christ is how he started that and so my family just kind of he got i have a huge family so he just kind of got us all involved in that and we started in that and uh so ever since then, I had actually been helping him uh, and his team. Never thought I would ever be having anything else to do with Relay. Definitely didn't think I'd ever have cancer at all. So uh, uh, Relay, it raises a lot of money for research. Uh, it continues to grow closer to a cure, just like my cancer. I mean, there's not a lot of people that have my type of cancer, so they need more money for research for this. And so... Um, Relay brings, that's what this does, and it brings cl people closer together. Uh, I'm sure you found out when you had cancer, you talked to somebody else that might have had the same thing or uh, took treatment, and you wanted to find out how their treatment went and what reaction they had, you know, how sick did they get. I mean, that's what you want to know. You want to know these things before starting. And so that's how research helps everyone know that is because uh, it, it helps you that. And then they also have... Uh, Throughout the whole United States, they have these websites that actually I didn't get on, but I could have found somebody that had the same type of cancer that I did that could have uh, that I could have talked to, and so that's what all this research does. And uh, so I'm proud to be in uh, participating in uh, Relay for Life, and I plan to do it. I hope until I grow old, and hope I continue continue to stay here on this earth to do that and uh, to help anyone else out. Um, but anyway, in closing, I just want to say I appreciate uh, Cindy for asking me. I appreciate it, Cindy, for you asking me to come. And uh, I want to thank everybody for, for their support, uh, for not just myself, but for everybody in here, because I'm sure you had some support system, support group, or family member that helped you. Uh, I want to show you this. This is uh, after I finished my, all my treatments. My co-workers got this for me. It says Survivor. Hope you can all see it. And I set it on uh, top of my TV, and so every day when I walk by, I see this. And that just reminds me, we're all survivors of something in this world. I mean, whether it be cancer, and I know a lot of you are cancer survivors, but uh, my husband may say he's a survivor for just putting up with me. I don't know. But we're all survivors of just being here on, on Earth because we, uh, we go through so much. But this is an uh, inspiration to me, and like I said, I look at it every day. And I'm so uh, tickled that they found this because I've never seen another one like it. I don't even know where they got it at. But anyway, uh, just want to remind you that you all are survivors, whether you are a, a, a spouse or just a family member or um, anybody that just uh, has dealt with this and gone through uh, these terrible diseases. So uh, thank you again, and thanks. it's nice to be here. I just wanted to ask Pam to stay up here just a minute and tell her how much we appreciate her sharing her story and know it's she's such an inspiration to all of us. So thank you, Pam. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next, I'm going to ask Marlene DeLong with American Cancer Society to come up, and she's going to make some presentations and make some recognitions as well. Marlene. On behalf of the uh, American Cancer Society and also the Warren County Relay for Life, I just want to thank you for coming out today. We really have a great crowd and we appreciate you coming out and supporting this. Uh, and after all, you are why we are here. 
our cancer survivors. That's why we relay. That's why we do everything we do. Uh, we're hoping to find a cure for cancer, develop new drugs, new treatments that's going to make this journey easier on you folks. So that's why that we're out here having fish fries and we're having bake sales and we're having yard sales and every t-shirt that you buy, every fight like a girl t-shirt that you buy, everything that you do uh, helps support our great cause here in Warren County. We do a great job. Um, also, I'd like to thank all of the committee members that come out today to help put this on. Um, we have our chairman with us today, uh, Mr. Dwight Birch. He's over in the back corner. Dwight, if you could wave to everybody. We want to thank you for all you've done this year. Um, thanks to Miss Emily, Miss Cindy, Melinda, Joey, Sharon, Miss Shirley, Tammy, uh, and most of all, we'd like to thank Miss Janice for being our caterer today and taking care of us and feeding us this good food. So thank you, Miss Janice. Um, all the committee members just give away. Okay. And there's Miss. I see another one, Miss Brenda. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, just want to invite you back to our relay for life. It's going to be June the fifth here in Mimble. So you probably uh, have already got that on your calendar. But we'd like to see all of our survivors out at relay. Uh, wear your purple shirt that you received today, and we're also going to have a special pin this year for you. So um, come on out to relay. Um, June the 5th. And as um, I think Sandy had mentioned earlier, someone had mentioned we have a lot of programs and services um, provided through the American Cancer Society, one of them being the Look Good, Feel Better session. Um, I know a few of you in this room may have been out to Tennessee Oncology. They do the classes, teaches you about your makeup and about wigs and that kind of thing. Um, we have the Hope Lodge in Nashville that provides lodging for Warren County residents. Um, that's a really nice place to stay, a home away from home. Uh, uh, we have a 1-800 number that you can call in if you're 2 o'clock in the morning, you have a question, you're not feeling well, something's going wrong. We have trained doctors and professionals that you can call in and talk to. It's the 1-800-ACS-2345, so you can call that number. Um, another thing that we have, and actually we had a college scholarship recipient here in Warren County this year, Miss Lauren Patterson. She um, was our college scholarship winner, and those are provided to a college or a high school senior, or actually a college freshman, that um, gives you a thousand dollar scholarship to further your education. And who knows, maybe one of these um, cancer survivors might be the one to find a cure or a new drug for cancer. So we are also proud to offer that program. Um, Someone had mentioned earlier that we have our Luminaria bags in honor or in memory of uh, some f folks, so if you would like to do that. And on the back table, we have a fundraiser. Actually, we have a team that's working on fundraiser today. So if you would like to pre-order a lipstick, um, Miss Pam Hodges is generously donating $5 per tube of lipstick to the Relay for Life. So that's a great fundraiser. She's taking orders today. You can write your name on the back of the paper. And any of these fundraisers that are going on, yard sales, bake sales, just be sure to support those, okay? All right, well, enough about me talking about the American Cancer Society and what we do, because we are here for you guys today. So we want to recognize our survivors. And let's start out with, um, if this is your first survivor brunch to attend, if you've just been newly diagnosed with cancer this year, please stand up. We have any new survivors that's been diagnosed this year, one year or less? Okay. We have two folks that have been diagnosed. Uh, one. How many? Two years? Six months, okay. So we are certainly proud to have you with us this year, and we hope to have you back many more years with us. Okay. Um, if you have been a survivor for five years or less, please stand up. A cancer survivor for five years or less, please stand up. Okay. If you have been a cancer survivor 10 years or less, okay, 10 years, okay. If you have been a cancer survivor 15 years or less, please stand. If you are a 20 year or less cancer survivor, please stand. Wow. Okay. 
25 years or less. 25? Wow. Okay. Okay. 30 years? 30 years or less? Okay. Wow. 35 years? 35. Wow. Okay. All right. Do we have anybody 40 years? 40 year survivor? Wow. Okay. 45? 45. Wow. Okay. 47. I'll put those. Okay. Has anybody been a cancer survivor longer than 47 years? Longer than 47 years. Okay. Ma'am, if I could ask you to come up front, would you mind coming up for us just a minute, please? That's right. You can survive getting in front of the truck. Okay. 47 years. 47 years. Okay. Okay. Let's tell them. Tell them your name and what type of cancer survivor you are. Joe Powers Rowland. Okay. And it was cervical cancer and it was diagnosed in 1962. Okay. I had um, 96 hours. I don't think they had chemotherapy. I haven't studied all this, but I had 96 hours of radiation. I had 15 cobalt treatments. And in 63, I had the hysterectomy. Okay. And after that, it's. Okay. It's been mine. I've survived the heart attack since then, so. We're certainly proud to have you here today, and we have a little something for you. I've survived a two-year marriage, too. Oh, that's <laughs> you survived marriage. So we have a little certificate for you, and this is a certificate from Miss Janice Kenimer, and she's going to provide a meal for four people delivered to your home. So you get some more oh, of her good wonderful. food. So thank you. Thank you. Give her a big round of applause. For those that missed the Survivor Brunch, we want to invite them out to Relay for Life on June the 5th. We'll have a tent set up, and if you weren't able to pick up your t-shirt or do your handprint, that will be available the night of Relay. We want every survivor that can to join us and walk the first lap. We hope to see you then.